I'm sorry I'm taking so long. Uh, but now I want to tell you about the strategies from heaven. When I arrived in the year 19, none of your business. <laughs> to the University of California at Berkeley, I thought God was torturing me. He said, I want you to start a revival and win thousands of souls on this campus. And my thought was, how do I get out of town? I had 25 cents, one suit of clothes. I'd taken everything I owned and put it back in my Volkswagen bug and moved to Berkeley. It's tragic when everything you own fits in the back of a Volkswagen bug. And my first home was a tool shed. That's right, six feet wide and about 10 feet long. That's where I lived. And I would get up and it was terror to witness on the streets of Telegraph Avenue. Abject terror. People said, man, you must have been some kind of a bold preacher. I broke out in a sweat. I prayed every night when I went on campus. It was sheer terror. And I had to, and I had to understand. People said, well, what about the word of knowledge? Let me tell you about the word of knowledge. It wasn't the stuff of people with big screens, skinny jeans, and fog machines. It was raw. It was something that God said to me in that, in that shed. He told me. He said, you can't be witnessing the way you are right now because you're getting slapped, beaten. You're getting things thrown at you, and nobody's listening. So if what I want you to do now is obey my instructions. I said, what do you want me to do, Lord? He said, pray in tongues. Testing, one, two, three. He said, pray in tongues. How long? As long as you need to. I want you to get your tracks, walk down to Telegraph and University, the, the hub of the revolution, and pray in tongues. And pray in tongues. He said, you're in Berkeley. Nobody's going to think you're weird. Matter of fact, you might have people join you. <laughs> Come up and go, is that what we're doing now? <laughs> so then, Lord said, pray in tongues, pray in tongues, and then you're going to know things. I'd look at somebody, I'm praying in tongues. And I walk up to them and say, are you from the state of? And they go, yeah, how'd you know? More on that later. I want to know, is this your problem? Massive headaches. Is that what's going on with you? And he said, yes. And I'm sitting there more scared than he is. <laughs> He's shocked. I'm terrified. <laughs> how did you know that? I said, because there is a God who took the form of man and he died for you. And when he ascended, he gave gifts. This is one of them. And you need Jesus. And they began to get saved. But listen, if I don't get an amen, that's fine. There, there is a difference between someone saved on the streets like that and someone that's been given a midnight car dealer altar call that goes on 20 minutes until they finally don't even know what it was that they walked up there for. Now, God wants to give you strategies. Look at me. To grow your church by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the first thing you do is take your church growth syllabus and throw it away. Dispose of it as if it were nuclear waste. Then get alone with God. And let God finally say all the things he's been trying to say. Here's your verse. Everybody look at me. 2 Timothy 2, verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. 
some for honor, some for dishonor. There is a doctrine of the culture of honor that I disagree with because it starts to become a participation trophy that everyone is honored. The Bible says there are people in the, in the house of God to be dishonored. And I've heard pastors say, well, we don't preach against false doctrine in our church because we're just trying to show everybody we're loving and if we do it long enough, they're gonna wake up to their false doctrine. When has that ever happened? If preaching again, look me in the eye, if preaching against false doctrine were wrong, then you have just nullified 67% of the New Testament. Because let me tell you what Paul did. Corrected false doctrine. Corrected false teaching. And leaders that were personally immoral were not let to slide because they had a beautiful singing voice and could attract a crowd in a concert. And you say, well, Mara, it's been working. We've got lots and lots of people. Don't you understand that the devil has turned the church in California into the best party going on the deck of the Titanic? We're so filled with false success. And the immediate important change is this. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, here's what it says. Separate yourself. It's time, pastor and leaders, politicians, business community, everyone represented here today. It's time for you to create separation from people that are immoral, that are your close associates. Now, you can't stop loving them, stop connecting with them, but you've got to disassociate. Pastors that are getting drunk, hooked on pornography, giving out, uh, advances, having multiple affairs that everyone overlooks simply because that man is well known and has built a big church. And it isn't just a matter of saving the church from that man, it's saving that man from himself. Do you know that we had a pastor who lived in immorality so long on the East Coast and he was never corrected, never confronted, never loved enough to be told, you can't be a man of God and do this stuff. Nobody told him, and he killed himself. He overdosed on drugs. The Bible tells us this promise. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Put a, some, uh, all right, let's give God praise right now and say, I want to be that vessel unto honor. I want to be that vessel unto honor. I wrote this this morning. Cleanse yourself, separate yourself. God will honor you with skill that is for this hour. Things you never thought of. Every good work means works the kind that this occasion demands. Now, how many of you are willing to offend hypocrites? How many of you are willing to offend those in your church that are pulling on you to do the things that are in the natural and not in the supernatural? How many of you are willing to offend them? You see, if you quit trying to please the carnal Christian who doesn't want to change, and you quit building your church on that individual and instead begin to preach what God tells you under the power of the anointing, God's going to send you a whole new generation and they're going to be on fire.